Thank you um, so much for having me. Uh, similar to Susan, I, I wish I could um, be there in person, um, maybe next year. Um, so I'm Fallon Mihalik and I'm an interdisciplinary artist working in public art and landscape architecture. I'm based in Houston, Texas in the United States. And today I'm talking about art as a tool for data expression. And my goal as an artist is to create an emotional and physical experience using natural systems data. On the screen, I have a map of the central part of Houston showing two of our major bayous and their floodplains. Um, the bayous define the ecology of our city. And um, I'll get into more detail in a moment. Um, before sharing the Bayou project, I wanted to just briefly talk about my work as an interdisciplinary artist. I work as a licensed landscape architect and public artist, and I design with natural systems to create parks and gardens and places for people to interact with nature and the natural world. I also create public art, various kinds of outdoor sculptural and light art installations, um, both permanent and temporary pieces to create new experiences in public space. Um, I'm an emerging practitioner. I've been doing this work for about 10 years and my work combines both of these disciplines to address nature and cities in the face of climate change. Climate change and um, data science are very big and often abstract ideas to the general public. And I think um, a number of the presenters today have uh, touched on that same theme of um, you know, how our uh, emotions drive us, not necessarily um, an understanding of uh, logic or, or science. So I'm interested in how to create a human-centered experience that relates us to climate and to nature. So um, up on the screen, I have uh, some images of one of my very first prototypes uh, called Climate Pulse. And it was a light art sculpture uh, that used sensors to create a pulsing of colored light in response to ambient temperature and humidity levels. Um, and these slides show our development of the light algorithm in the studio, along with this uh, low curvy uh, light art sculpture that you can sit on. Um, and that's our uh, development of the piece in the studio. And then here is um, this little sculpture installed in a public park on site. Um, so, um, that's um, where it all sort of began um, with this idea of using light art and climate and weather and natural systems data and bringing it into, you know, like a, a human experience, a, a space or a sculpture or an installation that you can inhabit. Um, so to set some of the context for this project that I'm going to focus on um, the Bayou Beacon, I want to explain that our city, Houston, it's defined by the bayous. And a bayou is um, like a slow moving stream of water that uh, kind of meanders through the city. And the bayous naturally flood, um, just as all you know, major uh, rivers, streams, water bodies, they, they naturally take on water and they flood. And so they have a flood plain. Well, Houston, uh, the most most of our city is actually built within the floodplain of of the bayous. Um, and in recent years, we've had a number of record breaking floods. Uh, one of the most notable being Hurricane Harvey. Um, I'm sure you all are familiar uh, with that event. Um, we had 50 inches of rain. Uh, that's 127 centimeters, I think. We had 50 inches of rainfall in one weekend. So to put that in perspective, Houston is already a very rainy city and we average 50 inches of rain across a whole year. So 
Um, it's really a mind boggling amount of rain and most of the city flooded uh, severely. I have uh, a house that's on what's called a uh, post and beam construction. And uh, so I don't have like a slab on grade foundation. And uh, during Hurricane Harvey, I had water flow underneath my house and I live in one of the highest um, parts of the city. So that is uh, just to sort of give you an understanding of what it was like. Um, and it was a very difficult and um, very emotional event for our city. And um, we're still uh, sort of reflecting on and processing, you know, everything that, that happened um, during that storm. And so I'm, I'm interested in our understanding of how the bayous function as resilient infrastructure and our relationship to the bayous as we see um, increased flooding, uh, flooding events. And I have um, a video that I can play just a, um, you know, few uh, clips from. The quality might be a little bit low and I, I have the sound turned off, but this will give you just an understanding of what this uh, light art installation was like. Um, so I'm gonna hit play and hopefully you can see it. It might be a little bit delayed, but I'll continue talking. Um, so the Bayou Beacon is a temporary light art projection that uses historic water flow data from one bayou and expresses the data as a swarm of pulsing water droplets. Uh, this video footage is actually sped up and the animation itself is a bit slower. Um, I have the sound, the video sound turned off, um, but I worked with a sound designer who used my recordings of uh, chirping frogs mixed with recordings of rain to make a sound piece that was tied to the animation. And the sound reverberated throughout this metal shell structure called a train shed. Um, and the result was, um, uh, a very um, immersive and very um, sensorial kind of experience. Um, so I'm going to go back to this. I'll go back to full screen. Okay, um, so I'm interested in reimagining Houston's bayous. Um, the image on the left, so the image on the left is not even from Hurricane Harvey. This uh, is part of one of the bayou floodplains that flooded during Tropical Storm Imelda in 2019. Um, and on the right, we're prototyping some different ideas about expressing water data in the studio. And, you know, the work is about expressing the bayous as a fluctuating system, something that is, it is fluctuating um, all day, every day in flood, in drought, in a typical rainstorm, um, a sunny afternoon, you know, it is it is always um, flowing water and related to the watershed. Um, but it is kind of perceived of as like background noise. And so, um, you know, I'm interested in that kind of like everyday idea of how the bayous are, are functioning. Um, so let's talk about some of the data. So in the United States, we have a network of stream gauges um, that send water data to a server that is actually publicly accessible. So on any major stream across the entire United States, the uh, USGS uh, federal, federal entity, you know, is actually uh, pulling data every every 15 in 15 minute increments. And there's a ton of data on the quality of the water, um, the quantity of the water, the volume of the water, the flood stage of the water. Um, and so um, it's a very high quality data and it's constantly updating. The chart at the left shows a bayou stream gauge uh, with water volume uh, here on this axis over time. And this is over uh, more or less a year, July, uh, 2019 to May 2020. And you can see, you know, this kind of spike in the graph might be a heavy rainstorm, um, you know, in August. And then if you look at 
this big spike here that um, you know seems like a deviant in the sort of average fluctuation, that big spike is actually uh, September 2019 from uh, Tropical Storm Imelda. So that's what the data in the chart looks like, um, you know, from that photo that I shared in the previous slide. And then <clears throat> the map at the right locates the stream gauge. That's this um, big bubble icon, locates the stream gauge uh, that this data is pulled from um, in relation to the art installation. So the art installation is here where this um, Bayou Beacon, this like beacon symbol is, and this distance across is uh, maybe, a, maybe a mile, maybe a little less. And so here's the White Oak Bayou, you know, that snakes through. Uh, this is downtown, downtown Houston. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about how to bring this data into a spatial experience. Um, we were given permission to use an underutilized post-industrial industrial space called a train shed. It's a hundred foot long, 20 foot wide space with a 20 foot ceiling height. So it's a big shell of um, metal uh, and it's open on either end. Um, and then it, it has a, a concrete uh, ground. So, you know, it's, it's like semi-protected, but it's more or less an outdoor, almost like a kind of pavilion. Um, and so our approach for making an immersive experience was to maximize this like very large, um, like dark void and to project the light uh, data, the animation into that like big dark um, void space using this round, rounded sort of curved uh, screen that's actually a special type of um, projection scrim um, that we uh, got from uh, the theater industry. And then as you saw in the video there are these other types of textiles and, and fabrics that um, you know, somewhat control the light and um, everything moves in the wind. So the water data is, you know, pulsing and fluctuating, but you're also like, uh, you still feel like you're kind of in an outdoor environment, feeling feeling the wind and um, these textiles sort of flowing around you um, and um, over you. And so that special type of projection screen like captures a crisp animation but also allows for the light from the projector and the animation to actually project through the screen and onto the space of the, the big tall ceiling. So um, that, that was like a, a really neat and dynamic effect. Um, so these are stills from an earlier iteration of the animation, the swarms of water droplets, um, you know, that swarm is like, moving and changing color and size based on the volume of water in the bayou. And um, there's a, a timestamp, you know, in the still, you can, you know, read the timestamp, but if you imagine, you know, this, uh, you know, happening um, in the animation, you know, you're watching the timestamp, the months are changing and um, you're seeing the timestamp here with the 15 minute increments of data. Um, so this is um, you know, basically a legend for the color code in our light algorithm. So there's a whole lot of um, you know, behind the scenes uh, things that have to happen in order to take this very large data set. Um, I forget the number of uh, actual data points over time, but we used 15 minute increments over um, uh, 2015 to 2020. Um, with a special sort of emphasis on uh, the year 2015 when we had a number of record-breaking record -breaking floods. Um, so, but what I wanna say about this, you know, sort of data like legend and um, any kind of explanation of the data, you know, we had it, um, you know, printed and you could sort of take it, you know, you could sort of take away the, the legend and the explanation and it had the map um, that I showed you before, you know, on this like flyer, but really we designed the experience in a way that was enveloping, um, you know, it like really enveloped the body and was at like 
a large scale so that it, um, you know, it really immersed you. Um, and what that means is that you, you don't really need the legend or the explanatory text. You just Im immerse yourself in this like flowing, you know, um, swarm of water droplets and in a flood event, um, the way the algorithm works is these water droplets uh, like increase in scale. And what that does to the experience is it, it feels like they are sort of coming, you know, they're like coming close to you. Um, and one, you know, little piece of feedback that I got from the public opening is a couple of people said, you know, it really does feel like flooding. Like that's how it feels when the city is flooding. Um, and so that felt like a very um, successful type of feedback for me to get because, you know, that's the goals to like, you know, immerse people in that experience and, um, you know, create, create that experience um, of, of the data. So it was also meant to be experienced from a distance. Um, in this urban space with these large leftover industrial structures, um, you know, it had to it had to really perform at the scale of the surrounding built environment. So I thought it was important that you know we really utilized this this dark void space, um, you know, to the largest extent extents possible. Um, you know, so that it would draw you know really draw people in and act like a beacon. And um, this documentation we did with a photographer, like in the middle of the night when no one was around, but for the uh, opening weekend for the event, you know, this whole space here was full and, um, you know, this plaza and like these spaces here, um, these like outdoor sort of gathering spaces were also occupied. And so, you know, you could sort of hang out here at the picnic tables, um, you know, and like understand the piece from a distance. And you could also obviously go in um, to get that like deeper immersive experience. Um, uh, one final note about that, if you can uh, see this, uh, this is me laying down under it. Um, I really wanted to give people a moment to, um, you know, to be reflective and to really sort of meditate and focus in on uh, experiencing this data animation. And so we set up mats on the ground and the sort of curvature and the angle of the screen are installed such that you can lay down and uh, look directly up and the swarming water droplets are taking, you know, really taking up your, your whole field um, of vision. So I have no idea how I'm doing on time, but I've got um, just two uh, final slides um, where I wanted to share some of the kind of logistics around the installation because there um, might be people in the audience who are interested in maybe uh, doing this kind of installation around uh, climate data or natural systems data or any other um, kind of you know urban urban data. Um, so I I put together. Um, a really wonderful team uh, to pull off the installation and the event. Um, so I, I had a person who worked on the, the algorithm and the data visualization aspects. Um, I collaborated with a, a sound designer who used my uh, audio recordings to loop the sound in a way that was connected to the animation. Uh, those special textiles I talked about are um, theater textiles. So I, I worked with um, someone who was like very skilled in how to actually sew all of those things together. They have to have um, like special types of connections to make them make them taut. Um, so that was a like a, someone with a theater design background. Um, and we rented a, a very powerful, um, projector and uh, we had a great like um, audiovisual support for that. Uh, we had to have a lift, so it was it was twenty you know it's a twenty five foot tall space and so we had to suspend the fabric um, up twenty five feet and so that took um, several assistants actually and then 
you know, just the, the writing and the illustration work for the flyer. I um, also collaborated with someone with an editorial background and an illustrator. Um, so, you know, that's that's like the, the multidisciplinary team because, um, you know, when we're talking about making an experience out of something as large and abstract as how we feel about flooding and how we connect that to data, you know, pulling that off is no, it's no small feat. So um, it helps to like really have a lot of diverse expertise um, on your team. And I'm like super grateful um, to my amazing collaborators. Um, and then one final thing I wanna say, um, the work was funded by the city of Houston through a tourism tax called the hotel occupancy tax. Uh, we call it HOT or HOT for short. And this tax takes um, a percentage from hotel occupancy fees and funds public cultural programming. So any kind of, you know, dance or performance or, you know, event or even, you know, uh, gallery opening uh, can take advantage of this funding. And it's a really great way for an artist like me to do something experiential, um, something a little bit experimental and event-based um, that's free and open to the public. So I'm taking tax dollars, um, you know, getting to produce this, you know, tourism tax dollars, getting to produce a publicly accessible event. And, you know, that kind of funding mechanism helps to like really bring the work into, um, uh, it makes it accessible to a larger audience and a very public art audience. Um, that's not just, you know, that's not just uh, kind of an art world audience or people who are interested in, um, you know, data expression. Um, so I have just a couple of um, key takeaways and um, I'm fortunate to be the, the last person to present, um, you know, in this uh, section of the conference because I, you know, I really, I, I'm, my presentation says a lot of the same things as um, the other presenters. And um, I know we'll talk about this more for the dialogue section, um, but I just wanna encourage, you know, you all to like think about how you might look for leftover, um, you know, underutilized spaces in the public realm. Uh, think about how you can collaborate with artists and designers and architects for their creative vision. Um, you know, and similar to how I talked about putting together a team, you know, I have the creative vision, but I don't have all of the technical expertise on how to design the algorithm and how to, um, you know, make a special sewing technique for the fabrics and, you know, all of these other things. So, um, you know, lead with uh, artists who can, you know, bring the creative vision and put together a team. Um, and then, you know, use publicly accessible data that's high quality. I think one of the reasons the, you know, we had so much data to work with for like crafting the animation. And, you know, we did, oh my gosh, we did months of just, you know, iterations of like what the data could even look like and what it could even feel like and, you know, what form it should take. And we got to really focus on the creative um, expression. We got to really focus on making the art when we were using like a very high quality data. 